Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Ryan Kelly, the sports director at WCTV. Of course, been a part of the WCTV Sports Department since 2018. And, you know, throughout that time, covered many local high school and youth sports throughout Tallahassee and the Big Bend. But when it comes to sports, we all know injuries are just kind of a part of the game. It's just where it goes. However, it's unavoidable, especially at the youth level. But treatment for youth sports is a little unique. It's a little different. These young athletes not only face the same challenges in recovering and rehabbing from injuries as any athlete or active adult would, but their growing bodies present unique circumstances and situations when it comes to medical treatment. But of course, we're very, very fortunate around here. Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare, our young athletes have access to first and foremost, pediatric comprehensive orthopedic surgery in the region. I got that all backwards. I'll say that again. First and most com comprehensive pediatric orthopedic surgery program in the nation. And we're joined by the region's only orthopedic pediatric surgeon today. That's Dr. Ryan Price. Dr. Price is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon for TMH and TOC, and he's who you want your child to see if they suffer orthopedic trauma or a sports-related injury. Dr. Price, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, I think a brief introduction's in order. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Uh, by the way, you described it all excellent. Um, my name is Dr. Ryan Price, and uh, I am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon here at TOC, and from what I understand, the first uh, fellowship trained um, or the, uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon here in the region. Um, I'm from Georgia, and I went to the University of Georgia, and then I went to uh, a residency in Ohio, followed by my um, fellowship in pediatrics in a Shriners Hospital in Portland, Oregon. And then we were dying to come back to the South and there was a, an, open, um, 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 an open spot here in Tallahassee and we were happy to jump on it uh, with my family. Um, as far as uh, uh, pediatric sports injuries, uh, I myself treat a wide spectrum of uh, pediatric um, uh, injuries and deformities, uh, but sports injuries is, um, is a subset uh, of a large population of kids I see. Now here at TOC, we have a wide range of excellent sports surgeons. We, uh, as a group, we take care of um, FSU players. And uh, by and large with the high school teams, um, we have uh, a lot of um, uh, very skilled and experienced uh, orthopedic surgeons. Now, I also treat many teenagers as well, but my primary focus is the younger, the younger crowd, younger kids, wide open growth plates, and a lot of their common issues. So um, although uh, they were being treated before, I'm able to put together a lot of comprehensive plans for younger kids. And one of the biggest things is prevention, just like we were discussing. And uh, not all pediatric sports injuries or just sports injuries in general are preventative, but there's a wide range that are. Um, so when I think about, um, sports injuries in general, and, and a lot of that applies to children, children are a little bit different because they have the, the, uh, added element of growth, the growing, the growth plates, um, and that, that plays a, a big role in how their bodies are dynamically changing. So we can't treat them just like, uh, someone who, like myself, who I haven't gotten any taller in over 20 years. And then, so my body's kind of used to its size. Um, a lot of their preventable injuries are because their bones are growing longer. They're every day, these kids are like taller than they were the day before, either by a millimeter or, or what. And so they grow very quickly and their muscles don't necessarily grow longer. I mean, somewhat, but that's kind of influenced by their activity. Um, they get bigger and stronger. And so as their muscles, excuse me, as their bones grow, their uh, muscles and tendons just kind of get tighter and tighter. So then they go and they do sports and they start, it's just, it's just a little bit too much because they usually tend to be really tight. So one of the key, the key things that we work on uh, in my clinic is prevention. And it really comes down to stretching, uh, proper conditioning. You can globally call it proper conditioning for the sport or uh, for whatever sport or activity they're playing. Uh, but the primary element of the conditioning that seems to be lacking is, is appropriate stretching. And did want to touch on that in a second, but before we go any further, did want to let you know watching live on Facebook or over Zoom, however you're watching us, 
please feel free to ask some questions. At the end of this, we will hold a Q&A segment with Dr. Price. So make sure you're sending yours in. You can do that, of course, on Facebook just by typing in the chat. Or if you're here on Zoom, right there on the bottom of your screen, there's that little Q&A button. Whenever the options pop up, type that, click that, type in there, and we will get to as many as possible at the end. But Dr. Price, uh, you know, you mentioned it right off the bat. And it's something that we, even as adults here, when you go to the gym, when you're playing pickup ball, whenever you're doing something physical, stretching is a huge deal. Conditioning, being in the right shape and the right frame of mind is so important to making sure that you don't get injured. And it's safe to say that that's no different for youth sports. Yeah, if anything, it's more important with, uh, with young kids. Um, we get in this nice spectrum in our 20s where our bodies are pretty resilient, still young, still pliable. When we get a little bit older, that weekend softball game turns into an Achilles tendon tear. Uh, but younger kids, they tend to get more, their, their bodies will start complaining of pain first before they typically will have an injury. So I think of these, um, uh, these type of injuries as like on a spectrum, preventable, somewhat preventable, and then not preventable. Um, some, someone comes in and just takes your leg out from under you. You have a traumatic ACL tear, something along those lines. There's, I mean, you're not going to be able to stretch your way out of that preventatively. However, uh, a large part of injuries um, occur when the athlete's tired. And then so that's why you always want them to be appropriately conditioned and, um, uh, and, and, and able to go full, full speed throughout the game. Usually what you see is a lot of these injuries will happen, these non-contact injuries in the late third, fourth quarter. If you have a, a football team that doesn't have a whole lot of depth and a bunch of good athletes, but they can't go both, I mean, they're going both ways, they're going to be smoked by the second half. So they really have to be very well conditioned. So what happens when the body, you start getting fatigued, uh, the first thing to go is, is essentially your core strengthening. Um, and when the core starts to go, you start demanding more out of the legs, you start running more inefficient. You're struggling with your gait. Uh, you're just kind of throwing your body into places and they become very susceptible to injury. Conditioning is, is, is by far the, the key element. Now, taking it back to a lot of pre like preventable things, these kids growing, like stretching is completely de-emphasized in youth sports. Um, we learn in PE at school, physical education, is to teach you how to take care of your body. Um, one, a lot of these kids, they know the stretches, um, but it's just like, well, when do I do it and how do I do it? And there seems to be a disconnect. They just think it's like, you know, PE is this thing that we burn some energy so we can focus on math more. And there's a lot of truth to that, but at the same time, they, they, there really needs to be a connection to say, oh, this is what I need to do. So I don't end up like, you know, anybody else name your injured athlete. Um, when people talk about stretching, the first thing that comes to mind is before they go do something. That's important. Um, we refer to those as dynamic stretches, warm up stretches. You combine stretches with some sort of semi aerobic uh, exercises to get the muscles warm. You're holding your stretches for 10 or 15 seconds. If that, that's fine. That's fine before, before uh, an activity to prevent um, injury. The thing that no one does is you have to go back and stretch after. And we really need to emphasize the dynamic stretches, or excuse me, the static stretches at that time. So dynamic is like kind of quicker, maybe sometimes a little bit of a bounce. The static stretches are long, drawn out, holding it. And uh, no one really likes that, but it's, it's really important for gaining ground on kids' mobility. Um, I make jokes with some of the kids and it's, you know, I a joke now, but initially I would tell them, I was like, you really need to be close to ballerina flexible. Um, that would be ideal. And they look at me and laugh. I'm like, can you do a split? And they're like, no, I mean, I can't do a split either, but mm -hmm. you know, I asked them like, you know, can you do a split? And they look at me and they laugh and it's just like, Oh, you really, that, that's how, so how far away the, the thought of being appropriately stretched is. So they get a lot of these really common uh, ailments and it fills, fills my clinics up with uh, things like Seaver's disease and Osgood Schlatter's and Sinden Larson Johansson's disease. They sound awful, but really they're just uh, growth plate inflammation at various places. Uh, people will commonly say, refer to them as growing pains, but 
that's not really what uh, the pediatric universe calls growing pains. Um, that's a different entity. For these apophysitis, are, they're preventable. And it's just a, it's a lack of, of stretching uh, conditioning. And, you know, it's, it's such a great point. You know, you bring up small school football. You bring up Ironman football. It's no surprise to me that when I go to places like, I'll give a couple shout outs here. Like when I go to McClay, when I go to Wasilla Christian, when we go to places that are small school, that maybe have 20 guys on the roster, that have a lot of Ironman positions, that more often than not, even if they're not always the biggest, they're always going to be the most well-conditioned. They're always going to be the most well-trained because the bodies need that. Coaches know that. And of course, the medical advice they're getting oftentimes from TMH or TOC says that. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a hundred percent. They develop that like over the season and, and plus at, at the games, they start to really understand, especially the younger guys, younger guys don't realize it. And then once they start getting into the games and third and fourth quarter rolls around, that's when you start seeing a lot of your crampings and people kind of pulling up with maybe a twinge in their hamstrings. And we just root the hamstring pulls, the quad pulls, the groin pulls, um, especially around the hips. And the, and the more explosive and higher caliber athlete, it's like the higher likelihood of them developing this. And even the more than them doing somewhat superhuman type of things, the, the, the more they really need to emphasize uh, range of motion improvement with stretching, stretching regularly, like a daily ordeal. You know, you mentioned dynamic versus static. Just, I guess, for the average person watching this right now, walk us through what one of those routines may look post and pre workout or practice or game sure. or whatever that situation is. So before before an exercise, I mean, when when you get to a football game and you see, you know, you sit down or any sport really, but you'll see the team kind of warming up and they're going through these drills, and that's a part of it. Those are warm ups. We all know about warm ups. Um, and then the stretches that you're doing. So you want to make sure that you're stretching like your key muscle groups that are going to be used for the sport. Um, it's fall. So I keep singling out football, but soccer, so a lot of these kids play year round soccer and year round basketball and, and baseball. And those that if a group of kids ever needed to stretch significantly, it's, it's the baseball kids. They tend to be really tight, especially with the volume at which they play. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because uh, year round sports, single sport athletes, that's a really popular and common thing. And um, not to jump on too many soapboxes right now, but um, so with with this, like pregame stretches, we'll say football or soccer, they really need to be emphasizing calf stretching and their hamstring stretches and their quad stretches and low back stretches. And they do those typically by uh, either sitting or standing, bending down, touching your toes, spreading your legs. You're holding all of these stretches for uh, 10 to 15 seconds. Um, and they do typically do it as a team. Um, after the game, after a practice, uh, you know, usually it's just like, man, hot and sweaty, everything. And I understand that with the games, but the practices is really where, where it needs to be hit or even on the weekends, um, when they don't have a practice, they really don't want to just let their bodies just get kind of stagnant and, and tight. That's when the injuries really start to kind of creep in. And sometimes they get injuries on Monday or Tuesday, but after a game, or excuse me, after a practice, or the activity, they want to do those same stretches. Just, I mean, you could just take it that simple, that easy. Just take those exact same stretches. Now hold them all for 60 seconds. You're sitting on the ground and you go and you touch your toes with both hands and you, you know, you just count, set your Alexa, Google timer, anything like that. And 60 seconds, you go to the other side, 60 seconds to the middle. Um, you're doing all of your, it's, it's going to be about, you know, eight, 10, 12 minutes of stretches. And it just needs to be kind of religious. And most of the kids that I see, they've never held anything longer than 30 seconds. And then so they're sitting there and they're like, oh, and they start to experience things like as they're stretching and holding it out, they're like, oh, I can, I'm getting a little further. They get a little bit of that, that creep from their fascia. So, um, I mean, there are, there are people that can get, you know, way more, they're, they're way more understanding and in depth to this, this situation um, with, with exercise science uh, professionals, but just to, just globally, just holding these stretches longer and 60 seconds seems to be a kind of the, uh, the minimum or, or a good target range for these. Yeah. And, you know, I think you brought it up. It's one of those things that, you know, I think anybody's felt that when you stretch and you hold it for a long time, it's, whoa, I could feel that. Whoa, that bit, the, the, the difference there is noticeable. Yeah. I, and the other, other element is I think about like the gymnasts, you know, every one of them, they, the Oscar, um, 
Osgood slaughters are tibial tubercle apophysitis or calcaneal apophysitis. I mean, every one of them get affected by it. Like, what's that? I said 10 out of 10 for pronouncing that. Oh, <laughs> the, uh, um, they are really good with, with stretching. Uh, their, their, uh, their hamstrings, their adductors, they're very flexible, but they do miss the mark on some of them just in general. So then it's very common for them to develop these uh, overuse, uh, overuse type uh, injuries with gymnastics, but they're stretching a lot. And I think about something like ballet, you know, they'll, these kids will have like an, let's just say an hour and a half ballet class. Uh, the first 45 minutes of their class is dedicated to stretching and warming up to get that motion just so they can do what they want to do. So you think about how much time they're dedicating during their, um, their, their practices, uh, ballet practice. I'm sure there's a better phrase for that. Their ballet class, but, um, that it needs to be something more in that ballpark. And it's, it really just misses the mark. Um, I try to really reach out to, to kids and explain to them that, um, no, uh, large entities don't really have, uh, what was the best way to describe this? So it's for fun for kids, elementary school, middle school, even high school. Um, but a lot of kids have aspirations of playing after high school, either college, semi-pro, professional, whatever their sport may be in. Um, and oftentimes, once they get to that level, the coaches at that level look at these kids and they already know, like, uh, I mean, you're going to take a year to get ready anyways, because your, your conditioning, I already know what it was like. You never stretched or you stretch, you thought you were stretching, but it wasn't ideal. So they have to, they have to go through this whole process at that level. And I wish that that, like when kids go to camps and college camps and learn these things, and they hear that from like big time, Nick Saban tells you, you need to stretch your hamstrings, you're too tight. You're dead to me in the first year because like you just you won't see the field you're too tight you get hurt and then we won't have you the rest of the time well that kid's going to stretch um and that's where you have these uh, preparatory schools like you know img academy or mount of sales in california where these kids are like rigorously stretching and conditioning and they're getting their bodies right and the second they graduate they're ready to go but the average that, that that focus just isn't there um, in general with the culture of middle school, elementary and high school sports. And you know, that, that's kind of fascinating to me when you know you, you talk about it sometimes, one sport athletes, which can now in these days, right, wrong or indifferent, can set in in middle school and elementary school. This is such an important thing for so many kids who are looking to play at the next level, who are trying to start early with it no matter what the circumstance that a lot of times they don't get that advice until college, like you said, and you, you kind of took my next question out of my mouth, just how important and what an edge this can give to athletes if they're just doing this properly. Man, I can't tell you if, if a kid is appropriately conditioned for their sport, um, there are things you can't control. You can't really control how tall you are, how fast your top end speed will be, your athletic ability. You can't really control those things. You can maximize your potential, but like not everyone is going is built like LeBron James. Things you can control, you should optimize. Your flexibility, your strength, your diet, your sleep regimen, your work ethic. Those are things that you can control. And that's where you'll see people, um, the, the college football, um, many professional sports, they're all full of just workhorses, just people that said, well, what can I do? And then they just do everything they can. And then that gives a lot of help for, you know, people who are not uh, that superior genetic God gifted athlete who are just born that way. Um, another, another point I kind of emphasize is uh, again with culture is um, kids, what is like the one thing that every child really on the planet, but you know, in the United States does every day consistently their entire childhood as they sit in a desk for eight hours. And that has such deleterious effects to their core. So, you know, nine, not even nine times out of 10, like 99 times out of a hundred, uh, the kid, the sport, the kids are trying to play. Uh, they're not, they're not really conditioned for it. I mean, they'll say they go to conditioning and they go through the process, but they're not really truly conditioned for it. They're really conditioned for sitting in a chair eight hours a day. 
even though they get up and they use the bathroom and then they switch classes, they're still sitting primarily the meat of the day. Um, and we, we have to compensate for that. I mean, you can't not go to school. That's not really in the question. So it just comes down to compensating for it. Um, and a big element of that is uh, just emphasizing core strengthening from the beginning, like at home. I tell a lot of these kids, and if they don't want to play sports and don't have any pain, I mean, you do what you want. But um, from pretty early on, if you got kids playing sports um, and they sat there all day at school with poor posture and their core is just kind of getting weakened, like have them do, you know, two to three minutes of planks at home. It's really not a whole lot, but doing a plank exercise to, just to compensate for that sitting. Running is great. Swimming is great. Walking the dog, just being active and playing your sport. All that's great. But that is not a specific exercise to your core. Your core muscles are your abdominals, your obliques, your back muscles, your, uh, your glutes, your, your hamstrings, it's all this, this core musculature. Um, and so we just we kind of prime these kids really for these injuries with, um, with, with, with just our culture of daily living and daily life. Yeah, it really is amazing just how much you can prevent just by taking a look at your day, taking a look at what you can do. So many preventable things, Dr. Price, but as we know, not all injuries are preventable. No amount of preparation is ever going to make injuries completely go away. You're going to see broken bones. You're going to see strains. You're going to see those shredded ACL and MCL tears, concussions, a litany of other injuries. Of course, you provide services as an orthopedic surgeon, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. But mm -hmm. what, what does an overview of treatment look like for many of the common injuries that we sustain throughout playing youth sports? Yeah, so, and you know, I just want to emphasize um, that uh, in TOC, like my partners and I, because we are very sports strong, very experienced, and I, I am just one small part in that system. Um, and I really try to emphasize a lot of the younger kids. Um, um, when kids do have, we'll, we'll start with something relatively preventable, like a Seavers disease, which again, sounds awful, but it's just growth plate inflammation in the heel. Oh, uh, it's going to hurt in general for, I mean, if, if the kid's not doing anything to make it better, um, it, it's just going to be an on and off thing. Maybe it'll feel better in three or four weeks. Uh, we can cast it or put it in a boot. But then they get kind of stiff in that, and really the problem is motion to begin with. So I really try to get them um, in a very aggressive stretching protocol for the calves. And I get them moving that every day. Um, I really try to emphasize that. I'd probably say 40 or 50 percent, that might be kind of high, maybe 30 or 40 percent of kids will, will diligently do it. It just depends on how much they hurt and um, how focused they are at their sport. Um, and then take an ibuprofen. Because uh, this is an inflammatory issue, and ibuprofen or any uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory or anti inflammatory medications. And so um, there's, there's various things that we can do, but if the, if, if the child and the family can do these stretches every day, the kid may be pain free in you know, six to eight weeks, which is a bummer because you're like, I've been doing these stretches every day for like two or three weeks and I feel a little different, but it still hurts. And then it's, it's like, ah, oh, it's a grind. You got to do it every day. And then once you feel good, you got to keep doing it. Hamstring pulls, hamstring tears. That's when you start getting to the, your older crowd um, with uh, growth plates that are getting close. Because usually your growth plates is like a, it's like a saving grace for young kids. When they start getting those pains, it's like a, a, a prequel to what's going to happen later. These things are going to heal up relatively quick. Um, there's no long-term damage with them for the most part. And um, it's kind of a warning sign. Like, Mm, you're 13, you're having a lot of these pains in your, in your anterior knee. That's going to turn into jumper's knee when you're a little bit older once those growth plates close. So your underlying problem doesn't go away. Where your pain is affected does. Um, so some of these injuries typically to be pain-free, it might take about six to eight weeks. Does that mean you can't play sports during that time? No. I mean, you can still go. Uh, you're just going to feel it. Um, but that also determines the severity of whatever injury you're dealing with. Broken bones, it depends on what's broken. You see kids out there with a cast in their arm um, and playing with it, like wrapped up in bubble wrap. So they're not using it as a weapon against other kids. Um, but sometimes it's like a foot injury, just depending on what they are. Sometimes you can get back later in the season. It all depends. A rule of thumb is most things in the body generally heal in about six to eight weeks. 
bone, soft tissue, ligament, whatever it may be. During that time of healing, they're going through tremendous deconditioning. So anything they can do in the meantime is pivotal. When you hear about an NFL athlete getting back to uh, getting back to the field after seven months of an ACL tear, I guarantee you that guy from day one was doing everything he could because the deconditioning process happens day one. Um, there was a study showing that uh, if you just walked around on a crutch, on crutches, and just didn't put your leg down for three days, you lose 30% of your thigh mass. And that's going to take months to get back. And three days. So um, the, the, the healing part and usually getting back to your sport um, sometimes can be prolonged just because of the deconditioning from staying off of it. So, um, you know, you, in every, every protocol is a little bit different. If you have surgery for an ACL tear, usually you're going to be out for the year. Um, you know, a hamstring pull, a broken bone, depending on what's broken. If it's a lower leg extremity, I mean, like a tibia fracture or an ankle fracture or something like that, typically that's the end of the season because it usually takes about at least 12 weeks before you're feeling good enough to really put some power on there. So um, those things, those things aren't always preventable. Um, and, but some of those are a bit of a gray area. And every ACL tear isn't a, some guy just clips you. Sometimes it's just like my knee buckled. I was tired. I went and did something and I stepped funny and then my knee gave. That's usually secondary to conditioning. Usually, not always, but, you know, conditioning definitely helps that. I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around 30% in three days. That's, that's it's okay. incredible. Like your thought, like how much you pound the earth. Like everyone's got Fitbits and they're like, I got my 8,000 steps in today. Uh, just imagine that's 20, it was my 24,000 steps that they don't get, you know, in three days. If they're, you know, very, very active, 12,000 a leg. So I know that's a hard one, but we are pounding the earth opposing gravity. That takes some mass. That's absolutely incredible to me. But uh, moving on, you know, talking about the overview of treatment from the parent perspective or from the player or the athlete perspective, you know, the doctor's office can be a scary thing for a lot of people at a lot of different ages, going to the hospital, going to TOC. Of course, everybody's there to help, but nobody wants to hear that they've got something wrong or that something needs fixed. But what does that patient experience sometimes look like, Dr. Price? Uh, so usually they come in, there's a lot of apprehension because of the unknown. People are, people are very, just the human nature. Uh, what I've, I mean, I've really come to find this, that people are very, very concerned with the unknown. They think the worst case scenario, myself included. However, uh, you know, when, when, you, when you take a look at whatever the injury may be or what it may potentially be, you can usually get a pretty good gist of what it is just from the history a thorough history, talking with the family, going over everything, the timeline, what happened. And then uh, you go and you do your physical, I'll do a physical exam. I try not to, don't try not to do anything to aggravate it. Unfortunately, um, a lot of our exams are like, hey, does it hurt here? Does it hurt here? It's always about reproducing the pain of the mechanism. Like, oh yeah, when I do that move, that's where it kills. And once, once you're able to kind of do that, you, you know, but usually it's, it's minimally painful. The younger the kid, they're always afraid I'm going to give them a vaccine or something in a shot. Like I, I try to like get that one off the table. You know, here's some stickers. Here's a lollipop. Um, I'm not going to give you a shot. Um, but just uh, going through the process, I, being accurate with the diagnosis. Sometimes it's it's a bit of a mystery, and then we have to go get further imaging and MRI, maybe special X-rays or a CT scan, something along those lines. Um, but I try to keep it low, low key. I try to be very direct and uh, as informative as I can and to allow the patient as well as, you know, our interaction for them to make the best decisions for themselves. Sometimes with kids, you can choose a non-operative route uh, versus a surgical route. Uh, sometimes it's like a 50, 50 it's, you know, uh, and they could go either way. There's, there's pros and cons to, to each, each path you take. And then, so, um, I, I try never to corner anybody into any, any uh, decision and I just present them with their options and, you know, we just kind of go from there. Just a couple more questions for you, Dr. Price, before we switch to, to, or to Q&A. Uh, before, if you didn't join us right off the top of this, 
We are taking your questions at the end of this conversation. Like I said, just a couple more questions with Dr. Price before we start fielding your questions. If you're on Facebook, feel free to type your questions into the chat. If you're joining us here on Zoom, the little Q&A feature on the bottom, when your little options pop up on the bottom of the screen, click on that, have your question. We'll have those sent you my way. I'll direct those to Dr. Price. We hope to get to as many as we can. But before we move on to that, Dr. Price, you, you know, you said something that's a little interesting. You talked about sometimes it's the surgery route for younger and youth athletes. Sometimes it's not. Just how different is treatment for a full grown adult or someone in their mid to early 20s versus someone who is 10, 11, 12 years old, someone who is a junior in high school? Just how does that compare? Well, so you have to really break it down between males and females. So unfortunately for females, um, they're under this understanding you know, by and large that they're gonna be done growing when they're about 16 or 18 years old. And it's more appropriate for guys. Girls are usually on average done, roughly done between the ages of like 12 and 14. So a lot of them will come in and anyway, so what's important is their process of skeletal maturity versus their age. So um, I may have a 15 year old male whose bones um, like maybe they have a constitutional growth delay and they haven't really hit a big growth spurt yet. So I can treat them a little bit more like I would treat a typical 11 or 12 year old, something a little bit younger. So their development, how much growth they have remaining is the key to that for me. Let's pick fractures. Fractures is an easy one. Broken bones. We, uh, orthopedic surgeons call all broken bones fractures. It doesn't matter if it's an open fracture, a closed fracture, the bone sticking out, they're all fractures. Um, with younger children, they have a lot of uh, remodeling potential because it's still growing. And then so something like a forearm fracture where someone breaks their arm, like right in the middle, they fall and it looks like they got like, you know, two elbows or two wrists right there. It's, it looks gruesome and everyone's uh, really, really nervous about it. You know, if you can get that relatively aligned and they're under 10 years old, it almost never requires surgery. If you can get it really well aligned with a, um, uh, like a lightly sedated reduction, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, no surgery. An adult, it, will, it won't heal. You, you have to have surgery. It's just, I mean, if you want to use that arm functional again, like you had it before, um, we don't have that remodeling of potential. We don't have that healing potential. Um, I feel like after the age of 25, adults are just, their, their bodies are just like not vigorously wanting to heal. Uh, a lot of adults have picked up a lot of bad habits. Uh, maybe not the right foods for too many decades or, um, you know, smoking, things like that. They really, they really hurt healing. Uh, children, they haven't been on earth long enough to, to eat uh, enough bad foods typically by the time they're like 12, 13 years old. And, um, you know, tobacco is not really an issue for the majority of those young ones. So, and plus their bodies are growing rapidly. So you just kind of have to put it in the right direction and non-operative management works. Um, it, that's a heavy part of my practice is uh, um, not operating when I don't need to and getting an optimal result. Um, but it, it really boils down to how much growth they have remaining. Dr. Price, before we switch over to Q&A, which again, friendly reminder, bottom of your screen, if you're on Zoom, type it in the comments if you're on Facebook. But uh, anything that we missed and that maybe you wanted to add before we moved on to Q&A? Um, let's see. I, th I think we pretty much they hit a lot of the stuff that I wanted to, dis wanted to discuss. Um, you know, our ancestors, we didn't sit all day. And that's, that's probably the, the biggest key that we have to kind of fight because it's so weird. We just, we get home, oh, let's just sit down. You know, our ancestors were hunting. They're in warfare all the time. Like there was no, this luxury we have called free time now. Um, we didn't have school a couple hundred years ago. Only the elite, the noble had got, got educated, got taught how to read. So this is um, a really kind of new thing in human evolution for everyone to be sitting in a desk eight hours a day. And so we having, I think it's much better. Uh, don't get me wrong. I don't think we should go back to the uh, medieval ages, but uh, we, we need to kind of incorporate um, and, and modify because we're, we're, pre, we're predisposing people to uh, tight muscles, a weakened core, which leads to back pain and 
um, that that's that's the, the the baseline type of thing. It's, uh, just people should get. We have to emphasize uh, conditioning for what we want to do in life for fun. All right, then let's get to it, Dr. Price. We have plenty of great questions. Let's shift gears. Uh, I can't believe I said that. Shifting gears is like the like taboo thing to say in news because that's when you say that you don't know how to segue to something. So I shouldn't have oh. said that, but you know what? We'll, sh we'll uh, segue anyway. How about that? Uh, Q&A, we've got some fantastic questions here, Dr. Price. And the first one's very, very good. Quote, are there any warning signs I should look out for as a parent in case my son is trying to tough through his injury without telling a parent or coach? Great question. So that pretty much sums up every baseball kid that's ever come into my office. I'm fine. I'm fine. We have a game, a tournament. I want to play. And then so you have to, um, each injury, injury has its own things that you can look out for. Uh, so for instance, nine times out of 10 lower leg injuries, uh, the limp, they're going to tell them themselves. They will walk great when they think you're looking. They can't hold it up. They get distracted like, ooh, candy. And then they start, they just limp. So look for limps. Um, baseball, throwers, uh, they start sidearming it. They don't throw with great form. They'll start winging it because their their shoulder hurts. But if they just throw with their they just throw you know their uh, their their pitching mechanics or throwing mechanics will change dramatically. They'll say they don't hurt. They're lying because they want to play. And so um, or or needing ibuprofen regularly. Normally kids don't really care about that. They just kind of tough it through. Um, but you just have to kind of watch them. Like most parents really know their kid and they're like, oh, what's wrong? Then they'll, if, it, if you even got prompted to ask your kid, were you feeling okay today? They're, they, and they, they're really motivated to not tell you that because you might shut them down. They probably got something going on. There's a, probably a good reason your spider sense is tingling. Uh, every, mm. like you said, every parent. Yeah, listen to your gut. Yes. Yeah. All right. Moving forward, can my child still participate in any light practice or drills with their team when recovering from an injury? I know we touched on this maybe a little bit, but uh, maybe expound on that a little bit more. Yeah, I, I so uh, team sports are, it's a team. Um, if you're not around, you're not part of the team. And that's generally how coaches see it. Uh, even if like you have a legitimate reason and you're, you're rehabbing and that, but if you're just not around, it's like you're not really a part of it. So, and if you plan on going back, if you're done, you're done. But if you're planning on going back, even in the same season, like you want to be there. You always want to be there. You take mental reps, you focus. There's other things you can do. There's other things that you being on the field, like, you know, there's, there's ways of getting better um, of just by being available. You can pick up on some weaknesses, spend time in other areas. Um, and then, you know, if it's an upper extremity thing, uh, sometimes you can just protect it and you limit it. Okay. So you break your forearm. You got a forearm cast on. You can play. Are you going to do bench press? Probably not. Um, so you, you'll have to modify what you're doing. If you got a boot on, you can be there. You can work your upper, upper extremities if you have an ankle issue. There's plenty of things. Or you see guys like in, in, um, on the sidelines in, in football or soccer, they're on an exercise bike just pedaling away. They're just trying to keep that aerobic and that, that conditioning. You're just trying to minimize your losses so you can get back faster. Uh, absolutely. They should, they should at least be there. All right. Next question, Dr. Price, should I be concerned about a high risk of re-injury when my child is recovering from a serious injury, such as a ruptured tendon or torn ligament? Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So one of the concerns are why did they tear to begin with? Uh, was it non-contact? And if it was non-contact, I mean, you don't have a mechanism. And they could, that can happen to the other side. So there's a lot of studies and research going into pre-injury exercises, like for the ACL uh, in particular. But um, yes, that, that should be a concern. Um, if a kid is like a, a broken bone, uh, like a bad uh, shin bone fracture, a tibia fracture, um, and then they heal, and then they get back to it. Maybe they were just hit funny. I mean, odds are it's healed. It's done. Uh, the odds of that happening again are you know, the same is happening to the other side. But if you had surgery to reconstruct a ligament, it should always be in your mind. Yeah. And I, I would really emphasize, but not only that, 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 uh, that brings up another point is 
if you were a kid with, um, I keep picking on Seavers disease. I can't tell you how many kids I see every day with uh, foot and ankle pain. Um, but you know, they got that heel pain and you're like, you're, you've got some tight calves. You're going to have to work on this forever. And that same kid with Seavers and goes through high school, does everything great. They're like 34 years old. They rupture their Achilles, you know, playing pickup basketball with their kids or something. So, um, these, these pains or injuries as a child is often, um, you know, you got to look at that as um, um, uh, a prequel for maybe a weakness and they just have to stay on top of it. They pull their back, back muscles all the time or always have a hurt low back. I mean, the, that's just, that's, that's something you, you just have to stay on top of and work, uh, stay, stay strong, stay flexible, um, make sure that your, your pregame warmups or whatever you do the rest of your life is always there because it's just going to be a, that's, that's your thing you know, with, um, you know, Greek mythology and you have Achilles, that was his weakness. I don't know. Maybe he should have stretched more. I don't know. Uh, let's stick with the uh, lower body injuries and let's talk a little bit of ankles and soccer, Dr. Price. Here's a question. My son plays a lot of soccer and is 16. Should I be concerned that his ankles click or pop when he walks? It's not painful, but is that a sign of something to come? Um, I don't, my gut answer is no, a painless pop. It's just a painless pop. Um, why it's happening. Maybe there's an imbalance of, of, uh, tightness. Um, maybe the front of the front of the, the front of the leg and the back of the leg, maybe a strength, uh, somewhat strength imbalance. It could be a, a sign, but I don't, I wouldn't say it's a, a prequel, uh, uh, to an injury per se, but in general, uh, things that just kind of pop and it doesn't seem to be a problem. Uh, it's, I don't think it's an issue in, until uh, pain's involved. All right. Nutrition question coming to us from, I believe your name is pronounced Lena. Hope I got that right. What is important to eat for a 10 year old to build strong bones and muscles? Ooh, it's same thing really for the adults. Um, you want to have a preservative free diet. And so, uh, oh, diet nutrition is a very, politically, no, well, not so much political, culturally charged topic. Um, I think there's some basic tenets that we can all agree with. Um, you know, avoiding our, our diets uh, rich in vegetables. When you hear fruits and vegetables all the time, it should be like fruits, vegetables, you know, like fruits are like, you should think of that as they're good, but we really should be, you know, doubling, tripling down on vegetables compared to fruits. And i you know, is a rough, I say that like, if you were to take everything that you ate during the day, and uh, this is kind of how I think about it, right or wrong, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of uh, opinions on it. But if you were to take everything you ate during the day, half of it should, in my opinion, be fruits or vegetables. And then the other half should be uh, lean proteins and uh, complex carbohydrates. So um, it seems that this topic evolves. Um, 30, 40 years ago, you're supposed to have like 11 starches a day to be healthy. Well, now the food pyramid's kind of flipped upside down. And so um, I can definitely see where this question is difficult and um, everyone kind of asks that similar question. I think if the basics are fruits and vegetables, uh, lean meats, um, limit, it's really limit the, the bad stuff, fast sugars, sodas. Oh, cut those out. Um, juices. Juices are, those have been sold to people for forever as, as healthy vitamin sources. Um, and if, if you've ever tried to make your own orange juice at home, like in a cup, how many oranges did you have to sacrifice? You know, like you're getting like nine oranges of juice out of it. I mean, if you ever eat nine oranges in a row, you, you probably stopped at three or four. Um, that's, that's, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, it's not my area of expertise, but those, those would be my recommendations. Again, your questions, Facebook live here on Q and a here in the zoom, make sure you're typing those in, not a question per se, but more of a comment going back to our stretching conversation from uh, Trisha on Facebook. She says, quote, I was active duty for 13 years. Thank you very much, first and foremost. We always did stretches and rotations before and after. I'd like to see more schools teach this, very important. I try to teach my kids, 
but my kids don't always listen to me. And so I guess, what is kind of your advice for a parent trying to teach their kids, listen, this is important. This is what you want. So uh, kids are very impressionable to what they see. So if they see you not stretching, they're probably going to think, you know, they're going to hear do as I say, not as I do. And that's kids pick up on that like super quick, but they see you stretching regularly. They're like, oh, this is part of our culture. This is what we do. And then so usually the, the parent has to be the role model for leading the charge and um, get down on the floor and stretch with them before they go to bed. You know, uh, stretching in the evening um, before you go to bed, it's not a painful or, well, I mean, it hurts a little bit, but when you're done, oh, it just relaxes the body. It's almost like a massage. Kids hit the rack much faster. They'll go to sleep a whole lot, a whole lot easier. Um, that's an uphill battle. And I wish, I wish our uh, society um, put more of an emphasis on it. Everything is bigger, faster, stronger and emphasizing technique. Uh, you know, you don't walk up to some dude and say, hey man, how's your splits coming? You know, it's, what, how much do you bench? What's your squat? You know, those are the measurements. And um, it, it doesn't have, you, you, I don't care really. Just, just that whole mindset is we, there's a devaluing on, on flexibility and, uh, or maybe it not being masculine or maybe a myth that, you know, flexible people aren't as fast. Uh, that's not true. Um, very quick and explosive athletes tend to be kind of tight. Uh, it's just because they don't stretch. Um, being flexible will not make them slower. It'll just keep them in the game longer. And another, another thing I, I tend to mention to a lot of people is like being tight or not stretching or being inflexible is going to end your career one day. That's whether you're an NBA player and you tore your Achilles and you just said it was fun while it lasted. I don't want to, I don't want to come back or you're in high school and um, you keep having groin pulls or hamstring pulls or back pulls, uh, pulled muscles and a pulled muscle is a small tear. Um, and then, so you're out for four weeks and then that next best guy who might be not as talented as you, but he can play hundred uh, percent. And then you get tired of watching someone with potentially less talent than you play more than you, you tend to quit or you don't like it. And then you either like get better and you get out there or sometimes you quit. So uh, no matter at what level, kids, your, your level of your love for the game is going to be superseded by your, your distaste and your, your anger towards being hurt. And usually that kind of ends things for you. So um, if you look at someone like LeBron James, who's been in, you know, he's like a perennial MVP candidate. And he's been in there forever. Um, this, this guy works. Tom Brady. Every time he steps on the field, he sets a record and he's so high functional. I, and if you look at their training regimens, it has always been loaded with a solid diet, a very meticulous diet, whatever it may be. Um, and, and flexibility and conditioning. They're, they are very well conditioned for their sport. Where most people in the NBA, they came in after LeBron was there. They had a few good run years, probably uh, went to um, uh, some all-star games. And then they retired, but yet here's still LeBron James, still going. Yeah, he's a he's an amazing talent, but he also uh, takes care of his body. And so if you even want to entertain or put yourself um, in a position for success, like that has to be a part of it, is being appropriately conditioned for your activity. You know, there's that old cliche in sports, Dr. Price, that the only person who's ever been undefeated is Father Time. And... It's all about just prolonging the game for as long as possible. You know he's going to win eventually. You're going to have to shut it down eventually. But it's a lot better if that's in your 40s or 50s than it is in your oh. late teens, early 20s. Yeah, even if you're just playing pickup games with your buddies, you know, and into your 40s. And I've, I've, um, I've played in some uh, adult league soccer games with uh, guys in their 60s, and they look great. I'm like, man, I don't – I hope I can do that. You know, I mean, some people's lifespans are into their sixties and these guys are out there going all at it. So yeah, it, it's over when you say it's over, as long as you want to keep, keep working at it. And um, I mean, your, your level of your top end level may, you know, it's going to drop just 
you know, over time, but you can stay active. You know, one final thing for me before we wrap here, by the way, first and foremost, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you so much for your questions, but, but did want to ask Dr. Price, because talking about trying to tough through injuries, talking about stretchings, talking about how sometimes that's not culturally the popular thing in certain sports. It's not culturally the certain, the right thing that, you know, players want to be popular. Kids will be kids. That's how this works. Just how much of a pushback do you sometimes find culturally to stretching the right, right way or admitting that you have an injury or just speaking up and saying that you're hurt or you don't feel like you can give it a go right now? Just how much pushback do you get from that? Well, it, it's, there's, a, there's a wide spectrum with that. Some sports, um, any sort of injury that you show is kind of seen as weakness, just culturally. And others, um, well, I guess that's, that's most, most sports. Uh, by and large, is uh, in team sports, every guy has a role to play. And if you can't fulfill that role, then you should probably let the next guy come in if, you know, with the team. And, but I mean, usually it's, it's pretty obvious playing through injuries. There's, 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 there's playing through pain and then there's playing through an injury. And sometimes with an injury, like you don't get a choice. You just, you have something that is not functioning. You can't fulfill your obligation to the, to the role you're supposed to play. But there's other times where you just kind of bruised up, you're still functional, you know, and you can, you can suck it up and, um, tough it out and play. Um, that, I mean, that's, and that's, that's for every athlete um, to decide for themselves when it just comes to something that maybe hurts. Um, in, in, if you are seeing a doctor for something, if you're seeing me for something, and I, I'll give you guidelines, I will tell you what your expectations are. And I'll be very clear with it saying, yeah, you can play. Pain is going to be a limiting factor for you, but you can pay through, play through this pain. It's just going to hurt, but it's not going to, it's not going to make things worse. Other times I'm like, don't you dare step on that field. <laughs> you, someone take this kid's helmet, like do not play. You will only make things worse. And so there's, you know, there's those two ends and then there's everything in between. Um, and then there's, there's level of competitive uh, competitiveness. Uh, if you're on a, a very high caliber team uh, functioning at the, the top end level, your backup is probably pretty close to your talent ability. And so that, that decision is probably going to be made for you. And that's a, yeah, it's that question's answer is going to be specific for most athletes in their situation. Yeah. You have to know your body and nobody knows your body more than likely better than you. Uh, before we wrap Dr. Price, uh, any last words or final thoughts from you? Um, well, first of all, I've, I've enjoyed this conversation with you. Uh, this was uh, a lot of fun, um, you know, and to be honest with you, a lot of the stuff that I've said today is just something I repeat over and over again every day. So uh, the more people to hear, hear this, uh, the better. And um, the bottom line, I think, of any of the words I've said over and over again is conditioning, be appropriately conditioned. And a key element to that conditioning that is often ignored is the flexibility and stretching part. Um, we, we just have to kind of turn the corner and embrace that element, uh, in sports. Otherwise my office is going to be full with preventable injuries. Dr. Price, thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys so much for joining us. You know, TMH and TOC people are all around and obviously all so, so helpful, but, uh, if you see them on the sidelines on a football Friday night or somewhere in the gym or your volleyball game or your basketball game. I know the season's about a month or two away high school wise, but thank these folks because they do such a great job keeping our kids safe, keeping them in the game and keeping them healthy. So Dr. Price, thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys so much for joining. We'll have a great day. Thanks Ryan.